Hey everyone, Pastor Tim here, and welcome back to our next class on the topic, Prayers of the Bible. So real quick recap, we've been looking at different prayers and digging into the topic of prayer in Scripture, and in particular, we've been looking at different people and how they prayed in the Bible, and our hope is that we can glean some truth from the way they prayed and um, the heart behind they prayed, the issues they were praying about to impact our prayer life. You know, we started off at the first class and said that um, looking at how people pray gives us a model of prayer, and maybe it's different than our normal expectation or experience of prayer, but that's good to help us kind of shift into maybe another additional way of praying. Um, there's no one exact perfect model for praying every single prayer. There's lots of different styles of prayer, but sometimes getting a new perspective can help reinvigorate our prayer lives. And so far we've looked at Abraham. We looked at, or Abram before his name was changed to Abraham. We've looked at the early church and uh, Peter and John and the early church praying in the book of Acts. We looked at Nehemiah and we've looked at the apostle Paul as well. And so this week we're going to be moving to John 17, which is known as the high priestly prayer. And as we always say, context is king. And so really John 12 through John 16 helps build up to John chapter 17. And so Jesus is going to be headed out into being arrested and then being tried and crucified very soon. And so John 12 to John 16 or into John 17 is Jesus with his closest followers. It's with his apostles, his disciples. He's spending time with those people who know him the most. He's giving them instructions on what it's going to be like to live out this Christ-centered kingdom life. He's also talking to them about uh, the realities of when he's gone, that the Holy Spirit will come and be a guide for them. And then as he closes out all this kind of instruction and sharing a meal with them, washing their feet in John 13, uh, John 17 is the high priestly prayer as Jesus prays to the Father. And we're going to see over the next three weeks, there's basically three chunks of the high priestly prayer. Um, and he's praying for his disciples right there. He's praying for God's purposes. And he's also praying for his future followers and future disciples. And so today we're going to be looking at uh, John 17 and just a handful of verses. We're going to start off with verses one through five. So John 17 is where we are, verses one through five. Let me read those out loud to us here. So it says this, after this, Jesus, after Jesus, <clears throat> let me start over. After Jesus said this, everything he said in the previous chapters, he looked toward heaven and prayed, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son that your son may glorify you. For you granted him authority over all people that he might give eternal life to those you have given him. Now this is eternal life that they know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. I have brought you glory on earth by finishing the work you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory I had before with you before the world began. Now this section of the prayer, I mean the entire prayer, but this section in particular is very lofty. It can feel very kind of esoteric and distant, but we want to pull it uh, from the heavens down to the earth and apply it to our lives. So let's see what we can learn <clears throat> about prayer and about Jesus in this section. The first thing we notice is that in verse one, it says, after Jesus said this, he looked toward the heavens and prayed, Father, the hour has come. And so Note that Jesus knows what's about to happen. He knows what's going down. And it can be easy for us to default and say, well, of course he knows. He's the God man. I don't think that's necessarily why he knows. I think he knows what's coming because he's seen what's happening. He knows his ultimate purpose, but he's also seen the animosity, the anger. He knows Judas has just betrayed him and left to go and to do what he's going to do, which is basically to rat out Jesus to get him arrested. And so Jesus knows what's going on. He realizes the situation in front of him. Now, I don't think that's the ultimate point of this passage for us when it comes to prayer, but we realize in light of what he knows, he will pray, right? In light of what the situation is, he will pray. That's kind of an obvious thing. We pray about situations that are uh, around us. It, it should cause us to pull back a little bit though and say, do we see situations clearly? Are we observing what is going on so that we can pray most effectively. We're not praying in this direction when the situation is going here. So slowing down, realizing the reality of the situation around us, and as we slow down and reflect on what's happening, then that leads into prayer. So there's one quick point for us. Another thing is that I want you to note the relationship. He knows that this prayer is about the glory of God. So it says, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son that your son may glorify you. So Jesus is saying, glorify me so that I can glorify you, Father. Now let's talk about that word glory, because that's a very kind of churchy Christian word, and we may not know exactly what it means. 
Um, the best definition I've heard of glory that was the most helpful for me uh, was from Dr. John Piper when he said, the glory, glory is the holiness of God gone public or made manifest. And so glory is the perfection of God. And when it's shown to the world and people say, yes, God is literally wonderful. He's full of wonder. He's holy and he's perfect and he's lovely. So if the glory, if glory is that when God's, the very nature of God is revealed to us and made manifest, Jesus going to the cross, according to this passage, will make much of the father and make much of the son. So basically, when Jesus goes to the cross, it displays the wonder of God and it displays of God the Father and it displays the wonder and the glory of God the Son and how they're both holy and wonderful and perfect and loving and just. All these things are manifest in the Son going to the cross. Later on in the New Testament, we read that Jesus and the gospel message of his life, death, and resurrection, that's the wisdom of God made manifest. So glory is the central theme here of this opening verse that Jesus says, I want you to be glorified and I want myself to be glorified. And that's all going to happen by me going to the cross. Um, I just jotted down this additional verse from John 13, 12 to 17. Jesus is making much of God the Father. God the Father is making much of Jesus. In John 13, verses 12 to 17, Jesus challenges his disciples and basically says that um, th they have the opportunity to glorify God. And so the question I would bring up for us is to say, um, I uh, Jesus, by going to the cross, is magnifying the Father. The Father, by engaging with the Son as he goes to the cross, is magnifying the Son, glorifying the Son. And Jesus says in John 13, we have the opportunity to also glorify God. And so my question is, am I doing that? Are you doing that? <clears throat> by how you live, by how you walk in obedience, by how you live out a life of passionate, service-filled, sacrificial love, are you glorifying God? That's something for us to wrestle with because Jesus, in his suffering, glorified the Father. Jesus, in the giving away of his, his life, glorified the Father and himself. And so he gives us a model to say, as I give my life away, it glorifies God. Now, there's two pieces there. One is to say, do I desire to glorify God? That's one piece. And if I do, how am I doing at that? Right? Because if I don't desire to glorify God, well, then it's a secondary issue because I don't have to ask about if I'm doing it well or not because I don't care about it. But if I'm a follower of Christ, I want to make much of the Father, the Son, <clears throat> excuse me, and the Spirit. And so the question is, how am I doing at that? How am I making much of God? And we read from the Apostle Paul that we have the opportunity to do that in all things, whether it's how we eat or we drink, when we work, when we play, when we rest, all those different ways we can honor and glorify God by being obedient to him in all areas of our life. So we're one verse in here, right? Jesus saying, God glorify our Father, glorify yourself as the Son is glorified in this process. Um. I think as we dig into this whole idea of glorifying God, um, <clears throat> I remember years ago, again, reading from John Piper, who was teaching on C.S. Lewis, about this idea of glory and wonder and joy in God. And here's, here's what C.S. Lewis says. I have a quote from him. He says this, We delight to praise what we enjoy because the praise not merely expresses it, but it completes the enjoyment. It is its appointed consummation. It's not out of compliment that lovers keep on telling one another how beautiful they are. The delight is incomplete until it is expressed. And so what, what Lewis is saying there is that it's a natural overflow for me to make much of the things that I love, right? So if I love my wife, if I love my kids, you'll hear me talk about them a lot. If I never talked about my wife or my children, you'd say there's something strange going on there. And I wonder if there's tension in the relationship, right? But if I love someone or something, I will make much of them. I will, if you will, glorify them. I will I will talk about the wonder, wonderful nature of my children, my wife, whatever it might be. I've often used the example. I have this picture of in the town of Newmarket where I live. If I was walking out of the Irving gas station and I had a lottery ticket and I looked and I won the lottery, my natural reaction would not be to run and hide. My natural reaction, I'd have to probably fight against the natural reaction of going and grabbing every single person and say, look, I won, I won, I won. Because it's a natural overflow of wanting to celebrate some good news, right? And so if I see God as wonderful, it will be the natural outflow of my life that I will glorify him.
And so part of my call as a Christian is to spend time meditating on the wonder and the beauty of God so that just like Jesus make much of the Father, I can make much of the Father, Son, and Spirit because I see the glory and the goodness of God and I want to tell the world about who he is. Okay, again, we're, we're only one verse in, so let's uh, let's continue to dig in here a little bit. Verse 2, Jesus says, For you granted him authority over all people that he might give eternal life to all those you have given to the to for all those you have you have given to him excuse me so first note here is god the father granted authority to the son for what well it says that he gave him the authority over all people that he might give eternal life to all those you have given him now for the sake of time and discussion we're not going to get into the whole predestination and the sovereignty of god and the freedom of humans that discussion but note that the father gives the son authority for what to offer eternal life or to give eternal life to his people. That's a beautiful thing. And we see that carried out in the life of Jesus. And then the command of Jesus in Matthew 28 is that we as his disciples would go and tell people about who he is so that they might have eternal life. And so I want you to see here, we are central in the mission of God, the father accomplishing his son through God, the son, which is to give eternal life. And Jesus is telling us to go and tell people about him so they can have eternal life. Right, Jesus says in Matthew 28, he says, All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Now go and make disciples. Go to the whole world and make disciples. Invite people to come to know and follow me. And so just as the Father and the Son are working on this mission, now he has invited us into that same mission. You've granted him authority over all people that he might give eternal life to those you have given to him. Jesus has the authority to give eternal life, and he's called us to be the messengers of that reality. So we can share that message with people. All right. So let's uh, let's keep digging in here. Within that question, I think it's worthwhile to ask, um, whenever we come up with this topic uh, or where we address this topic of eternal life, I think it's good for us to kind of slow down and ask ourselves the question, are you certain that you have eternal life? If God the Father gave the Son authority over something, then that something is really important. That something is eternal life. Do you have eternal life? Do you know that you know that you have eternal life? That's an important question. The Bible says if we confess with our mouth and believe in our heart that Jesus Christ is Lord, we will be saved. So confessing, declaring the fact that we've been saved and forgiven from our sin by what Jesus has done on the cross and that Jesus is the one who's now directing and guiding my life, that's how we can know that we have eternal life. So when Jesus talks about eternal life in this prayer, I think it's good for us to pause and just to ask, do I know, am I confident that I, ha that I have eternal life? So there's a reflection moment. Um, if you have questions about that, reach out to me. I would love to be a resource to you. If you want to dig into that topic more about assurance, um, I would highly recommend a message by J.D. Greer, who's a pastor down in North Carolina. You can hop on YouTube and just type in J.D. Greer Liberty University Convocation. He spoke at a convocation at Liberty University um, and the, and basically the topic was based off his book, Stop Inviting Jesus Into Your Heart. And he's talking about how people, um, they come to faith in Christ and then they keep praying the same prayer over and over again because they're not sure that they're truly saved. And so that's a great resource when he talks about our position with Christ as opposed to just a personal experience that we had um, at a conference or a retreat or something like that. So J.D. Greer, I think it's G-R... JD, the, the initials JD, and then Greer is G-R-A-E-R -E or E-A-R, Liberty, Un Liberty University Convocation. So I would encourage you to check that out if you have questions about assurance of salvation or um, knowing that you're ultimately saved. So that's verse two. Let's continue to dig in here a little bit. Verse three, watch this. Now this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Now, I think that's, I mean, eternal life is knowing God the Father and God the Son. This, in turn, means that eternal life is not a ton of other things. Um, by the very nature of how logic and the universe works, if this is a mug, that is not a phone, right? That's just how it works. My mug is not my phone. My phone is not my mug. So, this is eternal life, that you know the only true God, meaning God the Father, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. That's how you know you have eternal life, if that you know the only true God and you know the one that he has sent, Jesus Christ. That means that 
other things are not eternal life. If that is eternal life, other things, or even the opposite, is not eternal life. And so it's important to note that the majority of people, if you ask them, how do I know I'm going to heaven? It's the scale thing, right? I do more good than I do bad, and then I have eternal life. That's not the gospel message. It's not by works. It's by grace and our faith in the grace of God. It also means it's not about church attendance. It's not about being involved in church. Uh, I'm reading this great book called Future Church right now, talking about what does the church look like literally as we go into the future. And it was written before the pandemic. So it's very, very timely. Um, It was published, I think, just before the pandemic came out. And so it's very timely for thinking, how does this relate to the pandemic? But the reason I bring that up is that we can be so focused on church attendance and events and programs and miss out on the fact that eternal life is the central call of the church to proclaim the message of eternal life and God's kingdom to people. And eternal life is knowing the Father and the Son who was sent. And if that is the fact, if that's the truth, then that means that uh, we we have to focus our efforts on that stuff and not just being busy at church, not just going to church, not having potlucks, not playing softball, not having tons of Bible studies. All those things can be good, but we don't want the good to force out the best and the most important, which is knowing the Father and knowing the son that he has sent. Um, I found this quote from John Lennon. Listen to this quote. He says, I believe in God, but not as one thing, not as an old man in the sky. I believe that what people call God is something in all of us. I believe that what Jesus and Muhammad and Buddha and all the rest said was right. It's just that the translations have gone wrong. Now, that can sound very inviting and caring and open, but uh, theologically and even philosophically, take it outside of religion, philosophically, John Lennon clearly did not know a lot about world religions because to say what Jesus and Muhammad, Muhammad and Buddha said is all right, he doesn't know about what they've said because they're saying contradictory things. Buddha actually doesn't address the topic of God. Buddhism is by its de- very definition a non-theistic or maybe an atheistic religion. You can believe in God or not believe in God and still be a Buddhist. Um, Muhammad said something very different than what Jesus said. Muhammad would not believe that Jesus died on the cross to forgive the sins of the world. That's not what Muhammad taught. And Jesus taught things different than what Muhammad said. So by the very nature of things, if we go back to this verse where it says, this is eternal, now this is eternal life, that they know you, the one, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. If that is eternal life, then that means other things cannot be eternal life. And that's just the law of um, the exclusivity of, of truth is that, again, if this is my mug, it can't be my phone. Those things are not the same thing. My phone and my mug are different. And so because there are things that are certain things and things that are not certain things, because there are things that are true and things that are false, if Jesus, as he's praying, says, this is how you have eternal life, by knowing God the Father and the one he sent, Jesus the Son, that's eternal life. That means other things are not leading to eternal life. And that's a hard truth. But we have to wrestle with that and we have to engage with the fact that Jesus in this final um, prayer with his disciples in that intimate setting is praying very significant words knowing he's going to the cross. And so we need to take them very, very seriously. Um, If you're interested in a resource, I'll recommend a book to you. It's called No God But One, Allah or Jesus by Nabil Qureshi. Nabil Qureshi was a Muslim who converted to Christianity. He was an apologist. He was a medical doctor, uh, passed away a handful of years ago from cancer. Um, But he talks about the differences between Islam and Christianity when it comes to our understanding of who God is. So there's a resource for you. Now let's continue going on. Uh, Verse 4, I have brought you glory on earth. By finishing the work you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory I had with you before the world began. So here's a couple notes. I have brought you glory on earth by finishing the work you gave me to do. So, doing God's work brings honor or glory to him. Doing God's work brings honor or glory to him. That's true for Jesus, and that's true for you and me, and that goes back to that first verse, which is like, Jesus wants to make much of God the Father, and he's going to bring much glory to himself. Um, And so in light of that, Jesus is about bringing glory to the Father, and so we should be bringing glory to the Father. One of my favorite verses in the Bible is from Romans chapter 8, in verses 28 through 30. Now, again, I want to avoid the predestination question, but it says, um, those who were predestined to be conformed to the image of Christ and conformed to the image of Christ is the key phrase I want us to think about. 
Conformed means that we're going to look, we're going to be transformed or look, to look like something similar, right? So here's my phone, and if I had to turn something else to look like my phone, I'm conforming it to look like my phone. We're destined to be conformed to the image of Christ, our, not our physical being, but our e internal character and our spiritual nature, right? And so if that's true, then the reality is uh, Jesus brings glory to God. And so if we're going to be conformed to the image of Christ, we should be bringing glory to God. So he says, I brought glory to you, Father, while I'm here on earth by finishing the work you gave me to do. And so you and I can say the same thing. Jesus, Spirit, Father, we want to bring glory to you by doing the work that you have for us. Cross-reference for this is in Philippians chapter 2, where after we read this, this kind of hymn that was written about Jesus and his submission and then his resurrection and his um, honor and glory that's given to him, Paul tells us that we're to work out our own faith with fear and trembling because it's God who works in us and that God has uh, works for us to do. He has good works for us to carry out. So God has good work for us to carry out. And so because of that, that's just like Jesus. He had good work to carry out for the Father. And so just like Jesus brings honor to the Father and glory to the Father by doing the work, we bring honor to the Father by doing the work. Notice also Jesus' submission to God's plan. He says, verse 5, And now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory I had with you before the world began. Jesus knows that he doesn't have the fullness of his glory right now. Because this verse, this verse says, Glorify me in your presence, meaning, you know, after he's resurrected, with the glory I had when? I want the same glory I had before the world began, Father. So Jesus realized right now, realizes right now, he doesn't have the full glory um, that, he once, that he once had. And so... Um, that is a call. That is a, a call for us to realize that Jesus doesn't have the fullness of all things, if you will, um, like the glory uh, that he had before the world began. He doesn't have it in the same way all the time. And so there's a process and a plan that's being carried out. And so that's just a reminder that sometimes we want all the things that God has promised us in eternity, we want it right now. And that's the danger of, you know, the prosperity gospel today is that like God promised these things and give it right now. And so it's a, it's a poor, what we call eschatology, a study of the end times. It's a poor way of viewing things. It lacks the perspective that says, yes, there's suffering now, but there's glory in the future. There's suffering now, but there's glory in the future. Jesus realized there's suffering now, but there's glory to come. And so we have to be willing to walk within God's timeline, just like Jesus was willing to walk within God's timeline. So here's a couple questions. Do you want the glory or do you want God to get the glory? Do I want my life to be about glorifying myself or like Jesus, do I want the glory to point to God? So there's one question. Um, if it's about God, do you want his glory and do you want it in his timing? Right? Do If it's about God, do I have to say, God, I'm going to do this and I want you to be glorified. I want it to work like ABCD. Or am I just like Jesus willing to submit to God's purpose and plan for him to be magnified in my life, even if it doesn't line up with what my life currently looks like. Now, let me let me just give you a little a little glimpse here. This is the beauty. I just the beauty of the scripture and the gospel is that um, there is this. It's not a contradiction. It's a tension that is resolved in time, right? And so I remember years ago, um, we were going to be preaching in the, on the Sermon on the Mount from Matthew chapter five up to Matthew chapter seven. And I was charged with putting the information together, kind of the outline for the pastors. And so I entitled entitled it The Upside Down Kingdom because that is what Jesus is about and the gospel is about. It's this upside down way of engaging with the world. Jesus says, as you lay down your life and give your life away, you find your life. As you die spiritually and emotionally by sacrificing your life, you actually find what it means to truly live. As I let the old man pass away that I'm grabbing so tightly onto, I actually find the new man that God has made me to be. And so in the same way, Jesus is saying, Father, I want my life to glorify you. And then he says, I also want the glory that it had. And so he's like, I want my life to glorify you. And also I want to receive glory within your time. Just like Jesus, we too will receive glory. When we talk about the process of spiritual growth, um, there's really like these three phases that theologians talk about. We talked about justification, sanctification, and then glorification. Justification is something that 
happens when I trust in Christ, right? Like I'm not justified and then I trust in Christ and now I am justified. It's very, very much a legal transaction that like I was at odds with God. Now I'm at peace with God. I'm at enmity with God. Now I'm in the right standing with God. And we talked about that as a fact in the past. I have been saved through Christ. That's justification. Then there's a process that's going on in the present, and that's glorification. I am being saved. I am being conformed to Christ. I am being transformed in my character, so I'm more like Jesus. So we have justification happens in a moment. I'm not justified than I am when I trust in Christ. Sanctification, which is a process of me being transformed into the image of Christ. And then a future promise, which is glorification, which is that My body will be transformed. My character will be be transformed. I will be as God intended me to be in the future. And that's that glory that we're going to receive. So if you're saying, yeah, but I want glory, that's actually an okay thing. It's just how do you get it and what's the timing? We are promised to receive future glory. We read in the New Testament that don't you know you will judge the angels. There's a role that humans will have as being co-heirs with Christ and under shepherds and rulers of the world, and ultimately, I think the universe, but rulers of the world, just like Adam and Eve were, they were under shepherds, so they were they were um, authorities under the authority of God as they uh, ruled over the world. And so, in the new heavens and the new earth, you and I will have the glory that we are under shepherds, under rulers, compared to the ultimate king, which is obviously God. So, glory is a good thing. A desire for glory is a good thing. It's just that we have to have it within the right timeline. So those are the first five verses, and that's Jesus kind of orienting this prayer heavenward. I love the fact that he starts that way because it's very much like the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, heaven focused, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is as it is in heaven. It's all oriented heavenward, and then we look to ourselves. So in the same way, this opening section of the prayer, Jesus is orienting himself, his purpose, his plans toward the Father and towards the eternal realities of the kingdom of God. So here are some conclusions, some questions for us to consider. Number one, do we desire for God to be glorified in our lives? Do we desire for God to be glorified in our lives? Number two, do we believe Jesus has the authority to give eternal life? Not other people, but Jesus alone. This is eternal life, that you know the Father and that you know the Son he was sent. He is the source. Do you truly, truly believe that? If you believe it, then apply it to yourself and also apply it to others and share the message of eternal life through Jesus Christ. Number three, do we believe knowing God the Father and God the Son ha- is the means of eternal life? That's kind of what I was just what I was talking about. And number four, do we want glory for God and our glory in the right timing? This is about timing very much in the opening section of this prayer because Jesus is talking about what will happen and what he desires, but it's not right now because it's going to get dark before it gets light. It's going to be Friday, but as they say, Sunday's coming. So there's some food for thought um, on this topic of prayers of the Bible. I hope that um, this will encourage you to pray and help us to think about praying in a powerful way. Um, It's always hard to pray after reading the high priestly prayer because Jesus is the perfect prayer. Um, But let us take heart that he helps us in our weakness, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, and that the Father loves to hear from his children as we pray. So give your... um, Give yourself that space to enter into prayer and say, God, even though I'm frail in this and I'll never pray as perfectly as Jesus, I want to come to you and learn from how he prayed to you in John 17. All right. Thank you guys for uh, for tuning in. Feel free to leave comments or questions. You can always contact me via the comment section or email tcarpenter at bethanychurch.com. Thanks for watching, and we will uh, we'll see you next week. We've got two more sessions of prayers of the Bible. All right, everyone. Take care.